Like said, a few logistical uh, details I'll show you a little later, but before that, Bob will provide us with a brief for the comments to the logical value part for our guests. So, Bob. Yeah, thank you so much, Andre. Thank you, uh, Rosita Pilati, Donna Haraway, and Bruce Clark for accepting this uh, once in a lifetime opportunity uh, that we try to facilitate for as many people as possible in this faculty. And we thought actually uh, about the, uh, just the very possibility of establishing a connection between uh, the post human symbiotic transdisciplinary work that you've been doing that is inspiring so many people in so many levels and um, how to connect that to what we're doing here in this building, which is a faculty of architecture and the built environment. And of course, in that sense, it's a bit broader than just looking at buildings, but looking at entire constructed systems and landscapes that you've been speaking of yesterday, and including all the kind of different angles that we need from it. And in that regard, we wanted to maybe start by also situating ourselves as a theory group in there, because maybe not everybody knows even what architecture theory is. Um, and not even what we then as a architecture theory group do. So I wanted to start with a very brief introduction on that. Well, I guess now it's not working. Okay. Um, where the group architecture philosophy and theory and there's a spelling mistake already. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> <laughs> something had to go wrong. Um, yeah, it will continue. Um, <laughs> and see, we, even we are a bit nervous based on your presence. <laughs> um, so maybe not everybody knows that, let's say, uh, we started as a, as a group uh, that uh, sprang from the Delft School of Design almost 25 years ago. And the Delft School of Design was actually quite famous, I think, in architectural circles for being one of the first theory groups that really started to delve into uh, a structuralist theory, uh, French uh, uh, philosophy and thinkers, and try to adapt it also uh, to architecture just beyond the conceptual level, but more on a kind of question about uh, design ontology. And that has going on for 10 years until the DSD was formally shut down and replaced by, uh, let's say, NASA less funded architecture theory chair and since then we've been operating uh, in, in that kind of context and just last year we kind of rebranded ourselves by really centrally including the idea of philosophy in the mediation that we do between architecture and how to theorize it and how we do that together um, and in that regard we our mission statement is in a sense uh, based on the fact that we want to complement what we're doing in the faculty with a primary focus on ontology, epistemology, and methodological aspects of how do we even think and conceive architecture. And we argue in that sense that in order to respond to the most pressing issues of our time, that we need to understand societal, technological, and environmental demands of the contemporary world. And in that regard, Heidi has been pioneering to understand architecture as a material discursive practice that we always understand as a worlding practice. Um, so it goes much beyond the production of objects, but the production of systems. And of course, that approach is fundamentally inspired and owed to Jose Baidotti's work, who in the last book, Posthuman Feminism, really centrally argues that in the, in the present historical condition, we can no longer separate the changes on social, environmental, and technological levels and they need to be addressed together from a transdisciplinary angle. And of course, that very idea is fundamentally shaped by Felix Gattari's idea in the three ecologies, and that they need to be understood that what Gattari argues is that architecture lies precisely at the intersection of these three domains, and therefore we are in a very interesting position to think through and connect them and the webs uh, that they create and the webs that then turn into figurations we call architecture or built environments. And of course, this goes for fundamentally transversal, transdisciplinary angles that needs to be post-human and symbiotic because otherwise it's necessary to avoid 
any form of ontological hierarchy is how we maybe exceptionalize human agency as producers of these environments and maybe forget how we are produced by these environments. And in order to do that, we embrace, of course, difference and differentiation process at the heart. And that difference is, of course, a pure difference that's also informed by minor feminists. We are in decolonial angles because in this world, you can't do without those angles. And very much also then uh, um, Jose Guadalupe's idea about cartographic approaches, how they extend into genealogy, and that we even understand built environments as figurations, string figures, configurations, all those kind of things. The theory group back then has also started to set up a um, uh, journal back then founded by a lot of PhD students uh, from and beyond the architecture theory chair. And I think we are kind of proud that from the very first angle, we started from a transdisciplinary angle and addressed that explicitly. And these issues have been built up over the past, uh, what is it, 14 years now, uh, to increasingly complex questions, uh, how architecture is produced, is producing subjects, is involved in all those kind of webs we're entangled in. And one of the last issues that uh, Andre and I together edited uh, deals with Stiegler's notion of technical co-evolution, which of course in Stiegler's work is relatively isolated. And in that introduction, we also extended it towards the symbiotic angle, how we become with technologies, how we become with technicized environments. And that way of thinking also continues to the next issue that will be launched in spring, I think, uh, which will deal much more with cosmotechnics and uh, the question of worlds and worlding as well. And in case you don't know about it, because a lot of people don't know about the magazine, here's a link like self promo. <laughs> Um, we are also organizing a 10 year long uh, research seminar founded on Andre's research project Ecologies of Architecture, um, where we, every year we have an advanced PhD and also a master uh, reading group where we delve into specific uh, groups. So some days we, some year we dedicated entirely to Qatari's work. Uh, last year it was uh, based on Rigay. No? Also, there's too many editions already. And the next one will be on uh, Alicia Guerrero's uh, approach to, let's say, uh, complex system context matters, uh, or context changes everything. And the work is also paralleled by Andre's latest monograph, uh, where some of these ideas are also synthesized into it. Another kind of thing that, in a sense, we try to organize to give you just a scope of the different things we are engaged in. Um, in, in 2019, we organized uh, the annual National Deleuze Conference, Architecture of Life and Death, uh, with Jose Guadalci as a keynote speaker in there. And uh, that has also resulted in a publication where we also try to understand if we extend this kind of idea of the three ecologies and the eco aesthetics that, in some sense, come with it towards a new kind of understanding of built environments that is adequate for the Anthropocene. Another aspect that we highlight more and more also through Savos's input is the question of technicity or the term technicity and to understand technicity as a kind of elbow room um, that opens up possibility spaces within co-evolutions with design. And how to possibly theorize that? Because in a sense, it's a theorization that uh, is on the level of the virtual and how the virtual could be actualized otherwise. And there's a forthcoming issue on uh, this that's the result of several workshops that we had uh, during the lockdown initially through a kind of Zoom format. And similarly, turning that into a real life, our uh, last, I oh, know the, the point that I also make is that was, of course, uh, the moment that we got into contact with uh, Bruno. And the second point that converges today is the an event that we had last year, uh, Noetics Without a Mind, in collaboration with a uh, new institute in Rotterdam, where we've been yesterday. And the way that, in some sense, the idea about how technicities and pedagogies could be combined into new forms of thinking about space and the environment was, of course, very much facilitated by Setare. And Today, the program is a little bit based on this kind of convergence with the introduction first by Setare and then by uh, Bruno. 
uh, to frame these two aspects and how we combine the post-human aspect and the symbiotic aspect and how they would inform, uh, inform different ways of thinking uh, architecture and how architectural thinking also maybe gives something back to post-human thinking. One thing that is also shameless self-promotion is uh, that next year uh, we were asked to also organize the 16th International Deleuze and Qatari Studies Panel and Conference, which will center on the question of intelligence instituting and archiving. Um, we are expecting some two to 300 people probably to join and with uh, hopefully a very high profile, nice list of keynote speakers, uh, two of each will address the aspects in three days of intelligence instituting and archiving and uh, expanding the idea uh, from there, not just as a sticking to uh, canonical Deleuze-Gatarian thought, but hopefully going much beyond it and bringing in all the interesting things that have been going on in the past 50 years. And uh, of course, you're very much invited to check out the website and, and uh, submit a paper, submit a, a for that or ask us any questions you have about those. And before Andre is gonna explain a little bit the, the program and maybe the modus operandi today, I also wanted to uh, thank everybody that uh, submitted something for today, because it was an extremely competitive, uh, sadly competitive uh, process. Uh, but we tried to actually, as you say, we turned it around into trying to reveal already latent webs, we would see that hopefully we can thicken and whirl today. Um, but to not, let's say, exclude those that weren't part of that selection process, we actually invited everybody to submit a poster. Um, the posters you find at the windows of the other room. And so these are also posters from, let's say, other submissions. And uh, please check them out. If you find anything interesting there, there should be some contact details. If not, please contact us and we're happy to establish any kind of relationship with that. So hopefully this also turns into a becoming uh, and maybe something that, I don't know, maybe it's like too big to say, but like we would like to spark the idea of an architectural post-humanities or maybe whatever a post-human symbiotic architecture would be. And we could just consider this now as a networking event because you seem to be very interested in it as well. So that we can just see what we're gonna do with this from here on out. And that said, please explain how we're gonna do it. Thank you, both. Very, very briefly, um, as you can see here on the screen, the day is uh, divided into two equal parts, two parts, each featuring six presentations back to back to back to back. So you have to hold on, um, they can wait for the uh, hour long discussion for each thing. As uh, Rob already mentioned, Sayed uh, Marani and uh, Bruno Clark kindly set the form for respective, uh, for the respective sessions. Uh, we will break for lunch uh, at a certain point. There is a lot of everything we're running behind the schedule, so maybe that moves a little bit, like 15 minutes or so. Um, uh, as Rob already mentioned about the poster exhibition, we make sure that all the presenters have uh, their rare uh, badges, so if you find something interesting, People who are shy to ask questions publicly, we are kindly asked, requested that people stand next to their posters in case they, they want to you know, continue the conversation. Um, so, um, kindly switch your smartphones to uh, silent mode and immerse yourself in the unique posthuman symbiotic experience. Uh, as I said, I was not going to uh, introduce anybody, but I'll, I'll make an exception uh, to this rule immediately. Uh, I don't have a certain to introduce the panel and Seth is an architect, researcher, and curator at the New Institute who thrives at the nexus of academic research and art. So the proper transdisciplinary person through active participation in various experimental collectives. She was recently award, awarded a prestigious uh, Museum Talent Prize in I think 2021 by the Dutch Ministry of Culture and Science. Please support me and not on the Yeah. 
thank you for the kind introduction. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And hello, Rosie. Hello, Donna. <laughs> I'm really, really glad to be here, also on behalf of Media Institute uh, in Rotterdam. And uh, I was there uh, last evening, uh, witnessed Bruce's uh, a beautiful uh, um, introduction, keynote songs and song making. Um, Rosie's moderation, Donna's contribution, a beautiful keynote for me. It was a very grounding experience as well. Um, in, in, in really in times of uh, interlocking crises. So for me, it was a life affirming. Uh, it was a life affirming evening. And um, seeing my friends again, yeah, no, I enjoyed it very much. So it's, a, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be able to bridge um Delft and Rotterdam and, uh, and, and, and take the word here opening um the first session. So um yeah I, I said I'm a, I'm an architect curator researcher and the latter two I uh, I practice at the New Institute in Rotterdam and more specifically at the research department. Yeah I sometimes pull this in because some people don't know what Nieuwe Institute is. But it also serves as a nice backdrop for what I'm going to say. So, um, I, uh, I work at the research department in which we uh, truly have currently, I would say, uh, uh, we are testing out collective operations. So we don't call it the department anymore. We call it the collective. Sometimes we call ourselves a team. I think this is a nice introduction for uh, uh, where I want to go with the story in terms of not only like sticking to post-humanism, right, so the, uh, the, the title of the first session, but really bridging towards collective intelligence making, archiving, and the technologies implicated. So, uh, yeah, the same point uh, effort. So, the Institute's research collective advances post-disciplinary and multilingual knowledge practices moving beyond the traditional divide between theory-centric academic research and practical embodied forms of knowing. So the collective's practices are involved with research as a collaborative public activity aimed at creating a society that sustains all life. From this perspective, our exhibitions, public programs, publications, and notes exchange events are occasions for public investigation and experimentation. So recently, yeah, we, we are engaged in, uh, in in offering research nights, which is a series uh, in which we, um, you know, we open up the stage, test out ideas that are very, very uh, preliminary to a wider audience. And um, this uh, uh, connects to Eric Chen's, our, our, our general artistic director's definition of the testing ground, the institutional testing ground to articulate the speculative testing research practices as foundational for the institution's agenda-setting mandate. So in the context of only the institute, uh, the research collective asks how to approach research as a testing ground for regenerative, anti-colonial, feminist, racially and ethnic ethnically inclusive, more than human and intersectional spaces for collective world building. So, and the primary focus of our research projects is to produce knowledge that can bring theory into practice in various contexts through tool sheds and research labs, and sometimes just plain simply squatting the building to uh, to to operationalize your uh, in your thinking. So after last evening's keynote, I was compelled also due to Rosie's question at the beginning, uh, when did Donna Haraway's legacy touch you? To think again when uh, when that happened. And it was starting, uh, it was as a starting master's student here at this faculty, architecture, um, also surrounded with many of my friends and peers who are here as well in the audience who have invited me um, to uh, to make this introduction and and truly communing with them and uh, we were plotting back then you know, with my friends and peers um, a revival of our student association archers uh, along non-hierarchical stem poetic lines 
and we were thinking on our feet and with our tongues. So I thought how wonderful and powerful it was that we carried each other, becoming vessels for their brilliance. And myself more and more ajar because, um, yeah, like a part of the education, I could then start reversing and unlearning together with my friends. So that's when I truly learned to lean on them, making with and becoming with them. And currently, I would say, I mean, this was not too long ago. Currently, I consider myself occupied with examining the role that archives play in the construction of the history of cities and their inhabitants. This is a bit of a sneak peek in the background with dear friend uh, uh, Irina Davido Vici. Um, and um, yeah, so the role that archives play in the construction of the history of cities and their inhabitants. And through it being a commentator on institutional intelligence, memory, and amnesia, institutions leverage their horizons of action and inaction with the continuous need of self-preservation along channeled societal and political desires. This interplay between archives and the rituals of archival preservation, presentation, and narration co-constitute the thresholds of the institution, the technopolitics and biopolitics of memory. What and who is taken in or deliberately left out and more interestingly simply forgotten because it is not remembered or sensed? How do archives as testaments to, on the one hand, collectivity and life-affirming practices of creation, and on the other hand, violences of forgetting, silencing, situate themselves within the institution and are such and are as such instituted? I want to think along the Western institution, the university, the museum, the archive. An institution made up of many workers' intelligences, calculating systems, chips, codified rituals and fictions, and a collection of histories. Together, these agents and materials work towards the future, referencing pasts that are initially exteriorized, relying on the ability to retrieve information from memory technologies. The continuously changing relation between inside and outside knowledges poses a conflict as to what horizon of action is needed for its preservation. As of now, the Western knowledge institution in the Anthropocene typically operates, as Donner called it yesterday, an engineer's mindset, homeostasis. It keeps a strict interior and exterior milieu seemingly to safeguard its environment of behavior and control its knowledge. The future is sterilized and sanitized. It ignores the porosity needed in the flow of memory, the generational aspect of communal survival, the meeting of being and becoming, the virtual availability of other value systems, or better said, possibility of staying with the trouble the conflict of institutional memory and its political stakes lies in the binary through which it enforces its own existence as eternally living, assuring its earthly survival as a given while accelerating the death of its exteriority and so denying the actuality of its own porosity. The collective body that labors through it existing through mutuality for which the outside must not be contained. So the hollow biome. When the knowledge the institution tries to access is sensible but not knowledgeable and with losing sense and memory, the institution simply serves and is proletarianized. The horizons of the unknown or unknowable manifest themselves into constraints of our political imagination. So the Nida Institute, for example, uh, holds a collection of pasts, which is a state collection for architecture and urban planning. I work with it a lot as a researcher. 
Um, and we uh, identify this, or we often speak about this as a catalog of ideas and worldviews. And the emphasis is laid on the ways designers anticipate futures to come along with ethnicities and objects, transitions that pull one forward, always reflecting and bifurcating the choices that require anticipation and intelligent action. A collection of the negantropic drift, resisting disorder and building potential. Capturing and releasing the traces of these actions is a challenging feat. So, yeah, activating it for the audiences. It really matters how these thoughts and ideas are organized within the archive and how others can reflect on them. Archiving and collecting nowadays happens with increasingly sophisticated tools and techniques, advancing its ability to contain information and borrowing from Stiegler, subsequently running the risk of losing meaning and memory through technicization. During the years that I've been working for the Media Institute and it, with its collection, I've become more and more mindful of the urgency for collective awareness of what we preserve and how we preserve it, how we displace memory, how we keep it. That the project of building history, keeping legacy is a project of collective survival and need of mutual scaffolding. What knowledges do we need to collectively survive, to hold futures for humans and more than humans, for women, queer, black, people of color, indigenous folk? And are these the knowledges that survive at the hand of the institution? It is important to hold accountable which pasts are instrument instrumentalized to create collective imaginations, canonized as history and channels back to society, and to recognize the hands and minds of who, who decide on the stories that are let in, the archival matter, <laughs> papers, notes, drawings, models that at that specific time signify knowledge we see fit to be remembered. The motions of safeguarding history and are one exercise in dedicated archives and collections around the world along similar but slightly different protocols with varying capacities. A process that starts with the identification of interest, the hopefully warm contact with a donor, the building of a relationship and understanding of their history. Parallel by deep focus on archival objects, the choice thereof and the, te and the technical process we subject materials to. We sanitize them, putting them in quarantine, making inventories, and deciding on new resting places. Paper clips are removed from the stacks of handwritten notes, leaving behind the deep rust. The stack is moved to the quarantine facility. Bacteria and bugs are killed, while the archivist laments the bite marks from the mice that ate another drawing belonging to the archive. Some photos are crumpled. They were kept in a living room drawer. A faint tobacco smell lingers. The earlier mentioned stack of notes is neatly placed in between acid-free paper, paper into an acid-free folder stickered with a barcode. And all the while, a pile of notes remains untouched, left behind in the donor's living room. A correspondence narrated at times in intellectual exchange of ideas, a pondering of one's work, dry facts, conflict, something to be called activism, and the intimacy that runs through all of it. Those letters would have helped another generation endure. They were left on the table. So I make a messy and open-ended proposition of becoming with in the institution, with the archival matter, the fatty fingerprints, with the oily substances threatening the survival of images and notes, but bearing testament to a caring touch, a passing note of a, of a passing of a note for survival. To rethink the Western institution as a hollow biome 
radically non-aligned, dangerous to itself, opening itself up to recouple, to place life-affirming practices at the center of our knowledge and memory practices and the technologies connected to them, to have them ready at hand when we are lost for words and actions. A proposition of the institution becoming saturated with many knowledges, forming itself a brimming thick swamp where memories, stories, materials of the world ongoingly transfer onto each other, broadening our medical horizons. So as such, it is my pleasure to open this first round of, uh, of pictures, and uh, I look forward to learning from the abstract. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Karambaya Montrigiani, and I'm here today to present the work conducted as part of my thesis titled The Sea as I am, borderscaping the Mediterranean Basin, which used the Mediterranean as a mesocosm for the study of living on a damaged or troubled planet. <laughs> Starting from the acknowledgement that it matters what matters, we used to think other matters be, what words uh, say stories, what stories say words. The research focused on the volcanic island formation of Julia at the state of Sicily. Julia is usually deep in the ocean in the form of a soul, but occasionally rises above the sea and water following a volcanic eruption. This oceanic island state is deemed to dissolve soon following the erosion processes of the Mediterranean. Uh, completing this uh, cycle of appearance and disappearance in unknown time frames, Julia, in its Nera Nuria status, has the power to act as a strange figure capable of disrupting the established order of things in the Mediterranean basin. And here we see some uh, maps of the established order of things in the Mediterranean completed or disrupted migration routes, daily shipwrecks that turn the sea into a necropolis, completing killings, moving borders, overlapping territorial formats, multi-level infrastructural networks, permanent shipping lanes, extensive exploration or mining areas underwater, Erosion or sedimentation processes, borderless, uh, vulnerable ecosystems, waste clusters, sea level rise or acidification processes, changing borders between land and sea, as well as increased volcanic activity, are only a few of the areas that paint the fragmentary portrait of the Mediterranean as a fully operationalized and urbanized space. In its territorial constitution, orchestrated by a complex interplay between kino power, geo power, and necro power, revealed in the constitution of its soil, we can see all the neglected or forgotten stories, relations, things, or multi species entanglements. These traces of immanence and resistance contain within their synthetic arrangement and their participation in the living and dying patterns of Zoe, the possibility to enact a territorial thing with the trouble methodology, embedded not within concise projections about the future, but within knowing in the common practices.
the real south territoriality, inherent unavailability, and territorial agency give it the possibility to act as a snake to heat for the Mediterranean, bridging the discarcity and the material through the archetype and the matter of the island. This bridging refabulates the notion of the terraforming project as a project of symbiosis, a project of becoming weak. In the specific case of Julia, this becomes translated as the development of a spatial software of active forms, a conceptual and contextual in between, capable of retaining an unfolding relationship between potential. Guided by the materialities surrounding the seamount, Julia's structures evolved in ephemeral and indeterminate stages and trajectories until they succumbed to their own material finitude, completing their cycles of living and dying. They have the ability to create encounters, material uh, semiotic notings, and symbiotic arrangements, which are necessary for the coevolution of the complex systems and then the involved dwelling. In doing so, they remain consciously responsible and uh, accountable to the evaluation of the open possibilities and their consequences, embracing knowing as de facto process right and with often constrained locational limits. Waving words in this open ended context desk becomes not merely a matter of scale, but indeed a matter of kinship, translated into the networks of sea mounds found in the Mediterranean. The territorial project, in that sense, requires a differing by repetition act, which makes the conscious effort of revealing tracing of demands and resistance of following their traits in often damaged, troubled, or unknown paths, of engaging in different relations, processes, and things that constitute common grounds, and finally, of triggering mutations, metamorphosis, and new symbiotic arrangements. This knowing by creation methodology then guides the territorial design, bringing in the forefront the question of post-colonial geographies in spaces guided by metropolitans. How can the string figure of Julia, and indeed every string figure, exercise true accountability when operating in the realm of necropolitics without becoming operationalized by necropower? Thank you very much for your attention. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and also very honored um, to present my work in the context of the masterclass and of these very exciting contributions. Uh, thank you, Andre and Rob, for bringing us together and for making this event happen. My name is Johanna Just. Uh, I'm a fourth year doctoral fellow at the TH Zurich, where I'm supervised by Theresa Gandhi Isar, professor of landscape architecture and head of the chair of Being Alive. My background is in architecture. I studied at the Bartlett with UCL in London, where I also taught before moving to Switzerland. In my thesis, I explore modern human relations with disturbed landscape along the Upper Rhine plain uh, in Germany. This is the Rhine section between Basel and Bingen that stretches along the French-German border and that lies uh, in the Rift Valley of the Upper Rhine Garden. It is a region um, that is very dear and familiar to me. 
I grew up in the village uh, located right at the fault line of the geological rift, where one could overlook uh, the valley and on a clear day make out um, the recently demolished cooling towers of the Philipsburg nuclear power plant on the Rhine. But having lived abroad for more than 10 years, I'm revisiting the area now also somewhat as an outsider. In my thesis, I take the Rhine straightening and subsequent industrial development of the River Valley as a starting point to study the contemporary landscape as an achievement of modern human cohabitation that describes the area through a combination of writing and drawing, and I call this borrowing from Brunella to the notion of earthly uh, an earthly writing of space. Um, the, other, the Upper Rhine was dramatically altered at the beginning of the 19th century after the engineer Johann Gottfried Hunner proposed to straighten the river. While the project caused a loss of numerous biodiverse landscapes, as the length of the Leander was called, was cut by uh, dramatically, it also opened up opportunities for exploration by shipping, hydropower, and gravel industries. The contemporary landscape of the Upper Rhine which is characterized by flood protection folders, hydropower dams, and flooded gravel pits, reflects these transformations and invites studying the nature of disturbed sites. Additionally, looking at the maps and drawings created in preparation for the Rhine straightening, invites questioning the interrelation between landscape representation and the following transformations. In comparison to depictions uh, of the vital landscape that survived from the late um, 16th century, like the 12 meter long Rheinstrom culture uh, you can see uh, in the middle of the slide. The 19th century engineering drawings, uh, pictured above, for example, one of them, show a, rationalized, show a rationalized image of a violent and unpredictable meander. The highly simplified photographies seem to have allowed humans to detach from the territory reflecting um, how, and I quote uh, Donna Haraway, a conquering gaze from nowhere turned land and water into a resource to be mapped and appropriated. Well, more than 200 years after too long, spatial designers tend to simplify vital landscapes and lack adequate drawing methods to capture complex environmental interactions. Following Donna Haraway, my research pauses to retain vision in order to give I call it better accounts of the world. Take, taking the Upper Rhine Plain as an example, I explore disturbed landscapes as vital accomplishments of modern human cohabitation and examine related patterns, patterns of maintenance and friction. This process reveals how these processes and relations can generate alternative representations that could be seen as what Rosie Bredotti might call feminist critical cartographies of the Upper Rhine. These mappings diverge from anthropocentric narratives and flattening depictions, and instead rec help recognize vital milieus. Building on this premise, my research studies how vital milieus on the Upper Rhine are regulated through human and modern human rhythms and norms, and it proposes an approach for drawing them that unflattens the Upper Rhine and seeks to inspire more caring and inclusive spatial practices by advocating for a reorientation towards small human times and modes of inhabitation. On the one side, these mappings are inspired by illustrations accompanying, accompanying the work of Lena Gulis. On the other, I utilize the being a life language, a method uh, for drawing the soil as living entity uh, developed by the chair of Tarifa Gandhi Isad. And they helped me show um, the depicted elements and kind of the environment, uh, earth, water, and soil, as lively and as inhabited. The core for thesis are three case studies uh, centered on three animals that are historically linked to the river and the humans associated with them. And maybe this it could even be called uh, a form of a uh, symbol. They are traced uh, on, they can be found on the 16th century Einstein Karte and equally historical documents. And help me to challenge the anthropocentric gaze 
while opening up uh, another angle on the area. Following mosquitoes, uh, so-called uh, Reinschnaken, chapter one uh, of my thesis unpacks the ecology of the flood plains, changing from fever to flood water and container breeding mosquitoes. The amphibious insects reflect the transforming geographic conditions from the time of the strategy to contemporary renaturalization uh, projects. It reveals relations between mosquitoes and humans that developed in the floodplains through regulating the Rhine, bringing into view population uh, and water management, as well as alternative representations of the floodplains. Chapter two unpacks, uh, chapter two follows the swallow, the sand martin, also called the Rheinschwalbe, to the lower terrace, flooded gravel pits, uh, to the uh, terrace flooded gravel pits, to study novel ecologies uh, of extraction sites. Having lost their habitat on the Rhine, sand martins inhabit primarily the cliffs of mining sites. This case study foregrounds relations between birds, humans, and other organisms that developed in the lower terraces uh, mining sites through gravel extraction. The practice of birders and anglers show how these relations can generate alternative representations of mining sites. Uh, finally, chapter three traces the journey of the Atlantic salmon in the Rhine, uh, in German, the Rhine uh, through the Rhine Channel. Once home to more salmon than any other Euro uh, European river, over the last century, um, the Rhine lost and regained the precious fish. Following attempts to repopulate the river, the case that he reveals the relations between fish, humans, uh, between fish and humans that developed in and along the Rhine. It discusses their practices and challenges and hints at alternative representation of the river derived from the carry, from those caring for the salmon. As researchers and spatial practitioners working in times of environmental crisis, we have to expand our repertoire and look beyond existing methods and find ways of building bridges to other disciplines that can help us challenge anthropocentric ways of the uh, anthropocentric perspectives and develop sensitivity and attentiveness towards modern human modes of inhabitation. Building on scholarship from ecofeminism, multi-species studies, and animal geography, I employ ethnographic methods to make this to hope to tackle this challenge. As an architect, however, I rely on the knowledge of experts. I mostly engage with them in the practice of what I call multi-species walking, meaning that I accompany experts in their weekly, monthly, and yearly routines, which resulted in a set of very particular and sometimes very long uh, guided walks. For example, to trace the returning human salmon in the Rhine system, I joined the Electrical Fishing Survey Road to the River Vista. I accompanied several birders on their yearly journey account, uh, of counting and nesting sand margins on flooded gravel pits. And I followed different members of an anti mosquito association on controlled walks through bobby forests, meadows, uh, residential and industrial areas. Working with these experts allowed me to participate in their knowledge uh, about the animal, but it also helped me to get a sense uh, of the milieu through their situated accounts. And uh, this also brings me uh, to the central question of my research, which is... Um, so in an attempt to tell the life story, um, uh, how can we decenter the subjects or individuals, or maybe what Ursula Le Guin would call the heroes of our stories, and emphasize what's in between, namely the relations between the modern humans and the environment? How can we study the milieu? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Molly. 
Uh, I'm a, um, so I'm a doctoral student in Geneva. And my thesis is looking at the relationship between animals, time, and landscape design in the theory and practice of landscape architecture in the European traditions from the 16th century um, until today. And more specifically, I'm looking at the poetics and biopolitics with, of making with more than human animals in the drawing of landscapes. My investigation has two bodies of research. The first is gene genealogical, retracing the multi-species histories of common landscape motifs or assemblages that are found in, in, um, in landscapes today in and around Paris. And the aim here is to bear witness to the often overlooked agencies of other animals in the drawing of landscapes. If the squares, parks, and private gardens laid out over the past centuries are important habitats of urban ecologies in Paris today, their material assemblages are a dynamic archive of the biopolitics at play in past design context, as well as the stages of feral ecologies today. So retracing these nature cultures um, the work hopes to set a critical matrix or framework for the second area of investigation. And here I'm working with landscape students, um, ecologists, and people um, to, to imagine together opportunities and methods of interrupting the anthropocentric drawings of landscape. Engaged in a vein of pragmatic speculation, uh, the idea here is to explore the spatial and temporal conditions of our cohabitation with other animals, such as plankton species in the Rome River in the Geneva area, or also European bison migrating through um, the Jura Mountains of Switzerland. And at the heart of these investigations is the question, how can we cultivate scales of attention that are attuned to the vital interdependencies of life within our design context? Through the ideation and spatial transformation of living material assemblages, landscape architecture materializes relationships between human and non-human beings. It builds habitats or fails to build them, whether it's intentional or not intentional. And the needs to grasp, inquire, dream, or envision our shared urban sure. conditions call for a close attention to the relational politics that are drawn in and out of bodies in order to foster more profound and engaged care practices with human and other than human beings. So in this presentation, I will focus on one thread. Um, it's a ubiquitous and some of not many would say an unremarkable design landscape feature the green backdrop of urban schemes uh, from public parks to parking lots. It represents over a million hectares of land in France, 65 million hectares in the US. Um, I couldn't find reliable statistics for the Netherlands, I'm sorry. Um, it's dominated by handful of species, mainly Kentucky bluegrass. But lawn is a hybrid and hyper-engineered living assemblage, as well as a commercial product and a market, requiring specific construction techniques to install, soil amendments, preparations, but also specific management practices, mowing, watering, herbicides, fertilization uh, to maintain. This living assemblage, which is a carpet from which nothing should protrude that wages war on dandelions and thistles, uh, is a singular aesthetic that has colonized the world. Lawns are emblematic of the political ecologies of neoliberal capitalism, but they're also the stage for its discontent. We think about um, food not lawn movements and many others. Um, but the introduction of lawn, lawns as a deliberate design element traces back to the picturesque practices within 18th century English landscape gardens and to the male aristocratic taste for the undulating green carpets of their country estates that, and the sprawling grasses trimmed by the grazing teeth of, um, of cows and sheep that revealed the contours of their land. These gardens were designed with the intention of drawing a sublimated or improved nature uh, in which the, the work of man, human labor, had no place and therefore is meticulously concealed in artifice. The design relied on the world-making agencies of grazing animals, not only um, to maintain the health 
of uh, the lawn ecosystem, but also uh, the, uh, these estates were the engines of agricultural change and the intensification of farming practices and animal rearing provided the wealth necessary to pay for the implementation and upkeep of these designed landscapes. Uh, the reduction of raising animals uh, and grass into scenic ornaments within these landscapes embodies a naturalization of power structures, elevated as pastoral symbols, and picturesque framing of uh, non-human life conceals the industrialization of their bodies, their commodification, and exploitation. While the extensive human interventions of the last three centuries have fundamentally man manipulated these living organisms that compone the composed and how at assemblage, grasses and grazing, grazing animals in their bodies retain intrinsic narratives and ways of inhabiting the world that bear witness to millennia of coevolution alongside other species, soil, microfauna, gut microfauna, insect herbivores, humans, etc. So the work here is, uh, hopes to frame the short history of lawn and the design contest within the long narratives of coevolution between the grasses, grazing animals, humans, soil, and sky. And uh, so instead of to conclude, uh, I would like to read a poem which is part of, which guides my work and it's um, part of a collection which is called, Where Do We Go From Now? In the after image of light's fleeting dance, the earth's surface shimmers, the canvas of chance. Light cascades upon a sea of green, whispering in life with its cosmic embrace. An enveloping hue, soft, conversations radiate, seeping into each blade, affectionate exchanges between brown, the grass, grazing, the gloom. Prisms of life, halos entwined. On the horizon, vivid flashes unfold. Closed eyes witness a reverie of shades, verdant phantoms and forms, alive, pulsating. A rambling image, a landscape in motion. Photons etch their fiery imprints on retinas and beyond. An intimate burning of tender, tales ancient and new. Scratching echoes of reflections afar, worlds sung in the shadows, spun by earth and sky, Unfurn unfurling bound circles, a wandering eye. To listen beyond our reach, glimpse further than our gaze, to fields diffracted, where shadow stories place. <laughs> That would be rehearsed by the solos you need in the images. Which for all the images. I admit that I'm way out of my comfort zone now. <laughs> uh, well, my usual surroundings are I'm able to make things uh, the same basis of talent, actions, addictions, quoting, uh, because I live in Barcelona and after years of engaging with these kind of things, um, I got the opportunity to do my PhD on the I got the opportunity to do my PhD on the anarchy suits of urban planning movement. My mission aim was to reconstruct the continuous influence of anarchist ideas on the history and present of urban planning while working with authors engaged with how the built environment and the access to resources are shaped and shaped by collaborative social action in the of the This, from the very first point, meant engaging with the archives, with uh, letters, with uh, communications and, and reports, but also it meant confronting some of the contradictions. The first one being the scale of this kind of fine-grained uh, ways in how uh, built environment is uh, reproduced against the grand, grand narratives and abstractions of the disciplines when applied in the historiography of the cities. And the second is a bit more specific, is this inherent definition of uh, urban planning as a discipline in opposition to something called uncontrolled urbanization. 
uh, while at the same time one can observe the transversality of social life in the ways how we produce our cities, how we produce our surroundings, territories, regions, and homes. So after engaging with the archives and trying to build this 150 years long vector network of anarchist and planning communication, um, I started to think how differently uh, defined or explain uh, urbanism. And, and I developed something that I call planning cultures as a heterotopian evolution of the human environment symposis. Let me explain a little bit further. This is the first uh, kind of a diagram we did during the first year of my PhD on the genealogy of planning, in which we kind of put together the fragments of the story of how early anarchist thinkers, like Peter Kropotkin and Lisa Curious, you were geographers. So therefore, the early anarchism was very influenced by the spatial visions of you know, small communes, uh, cooperatives, workshops, fields, and factories. Um, while, for example, the Marxist theory was less influenced by that because of its foundations in political philosophy. Um, so how they, together with the massive movements of uh, land, uh, housing, and labor rights at the turn of the century, impacted the early days of uh, planning. And specifically, the figures such as Pat Vigedes, Louis Marfort, Ebenezer Howard, and many others. Later, we kind of tried to connect that to the post war experiences in which the architects and planners who more explicitly engaged with anarchism tried to use the experiences of self help housing, of autonomous actions, of participation in architecture, uh, of bio regional and kind of regional urbanism to explain what might be the future of, of uh, how we engage with built environment. And in that context, the books in social ecology appears kind of as an important concept, but kind of a sign of not really involved in the whole stream of historical influences. However, this genealogy is very far from a true genealogy of what happened. And you realize that when you enter the archives, what you find out that the true historical fabric of how, the, uh, how we make built uh, environment on this of notes in which kind of people come together places, materials, tools, and knowledges create some kind of experiences for which can say that they make the social ecology of built environment. The built environment in the Fabian sense also we could say social space is made by political subjects who tend to employ mutual aid, self-initiative, direct action, collaboration to achieve social reproduction, relative individual freedom, regulate sufficiency, and all that kind of affirmed the idea of radical multiplicity of how we carve the space for ourselves in, in, in this world. Um, in this case, is the one of these nodes. So this is a Lariston building development where the group of tenants uh, took the form of DIY building method developed by Walter Segal, who was the anarchist, who was the architect born in the anarchist commune in Alps, later settled in London. But also what is curious is how they got the land. So they got the land when the, another anarchist architect, Colin Ward, engaged and convinced together with a couple on the upper left, a local Lewis team authorities to give the land that was a public land supposed to be uh, developed as a public housing to this group of people who wanted to try things on their own. So this kind of nods uh, in the social ecology of built environment, um, they kind of show also how they are interwoven with the everyday practices and the kind of socio-political uh, constellations in particular moments and situations, situated context. So how this informs the ideas on planning history and genealogy of it. Generally, when we speak of planning, we speak of two camps, more or less, very roughly speaking. One camp speaks of uh, planning as a kind of benevolent, positivistic, quite anthropocentric discipline that tries to create a negotiation table on which we, by the technocratic means, try to create a common ground. Uh, for what is the development of the city. And the other side of it is uh, uh, the, the same negotiation table behind the closed doors, or how the Marxist and critical scholars usually engage with these ideas of enclosures, uh, of communes, in red linings, gentrifications, all these kind of ways in which how planning contributes to uh, reformation and, and reproduction of capitalism. But both of these studies are just a partial image of how the planning actually works. And these studies of how we develop the cities, we would call generally urbanism. And if we consider that, that the built environment comes from this collaborative social action, this symposium of environment uh, happens through, through these multiple experiences, 
we actually can think of planning culture. So the vast landscape of, of indigenous, bottom up, top down, illegal, legal, formal, informal, Latin American, European, Western, all different kinds of how people engage with planning and rebuilding. And, and it does relies on an instinctive understanding that the freedom to build one or many achieve control over their environment. And that, 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 that need to control the environment is essential like food, sleep, shelter, and all others. If we connect these planning cultures with the biophysical context in which they happen, um, we, actually the environment, we can start speaking of a little bit more coherent concept of social ecology. And then in the end, um, what this made me in my work confront another contradiction is how to narrate this. So the mainstream genealogy of planning usually ignores these kind of specific experiences that when you enter the archives, you just I was now the whole week in Amsterdam in the Institute of uh, Social History. And every time I enter every archive, be it a small neighborhood archive or official state archive, you are confronted with such amazing facts that we just forget. So the question is, if the neighborhood grassroots and communal histories assemble a genealogy of planning sprouting from an intrinsic sensitivity for a radical multiplicity of local situated technologies, Finnish freedoms, fragmented autonomies, and self-made communities that are also often stubbornly blind to these grand narratives of discipline. How do we tell the stories or histories of why we build? So my question is, how do we construct the genealogies of post-human environment synthesis? And like this, I get to see that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and esteemed guests. Um, my name is Christian. I'm uh, really grateful to be here to talk to you a bit about this conundrum that we have formulated of thinking as environments. Uh, and the trouble I've gotten into working through it in my uh, PhD at UCEF, supervised ideas from the, the parent of the um, uh, on ecological governance. Uh, this, um, this PhD, uh, in, in it, I tried to propose a shift from a, a purposive notion of governance to an adaptive notion uh, of governance by elaborating techniques of environmental relating, not in the Anthropocene, but amid the Holocene collapse, which I find to be a more uh, both open and urgent notion of uh, to to uh, to situate ourselves in an ancient age. Um, I do so with new materialisms and decolonial. Ecology, democracy, crossing back and forth between academia uh, and my efforts with extinction, uh, rebellion, and in uh, urban ecology. So, uh, right off the bat, I found this proposal of thinking as environment that causes kind of an interesting apoia, kind of a foreclosure of thought in a certain sense that I wanted to, to stay with and explore. Um, and in this sense, thinking as environment for me, you know, it served as a horizon, but definitely not as a destination. Of the thinking um, by which we might be able to move away from these uh, modernistic notions of agency, away from what Santiago Castel Gomez calls zero point epistemologies. Um, and I think the zero point, you know, there's many ways to, to phrase this, God tricks uh, and others, but the zero point I think really captures this vanishing trick of self enclosed modernisms, where I think environmental destruction is presumed a priori. <coughs> so my intuition is that thinking as environment might interfere with this play of a priori destruction. I foreclose a certain purposive aspect of agency. And this is what Ursula K. Green talked about with the sphere, right? And striking its target. I think that this assumption of purposiveness might even, dare I say, trouble theories of relation and co emergence. Where making and mattering perhaps are still doings too. And this is the tension I want to explore. Taking up Le Guin's favorite instrument, the carrier bag, where uh, I want to note that the work is actually done by the empty space inside of the bag. And with that, in that day, I want to ask this question. Thinking as environment, 
maybe even as a, as a Taoistic question in, in a sense um, of complementarity that I hope might deepen uh, post human thinking as well as our articulation and cultivation of responsibility. So, to summarize this uh, point, you know, if we reach back kind of through personal histories into the deep time of evolutionary history, um, maybe even to the blurry beginnings of life, I think, you know, in some sense, at least, we can say that the environment always, uh, it comes before us, is in some senses an a priori. Um, and in that sense, we are always stuck in the middle. So being stuck in the middle, and in particular in Holocene collapse, I think indeed this question is what to open up to. And in opening up, I wonder with Murad and others about the material basis for its performance. And so the respondents have taken up Felix Quadri's notion of transversality. And this is an kind of elusive concept of, of cross connection, as he says, a praxis taking on a context. And I trace from his group psychiatric practice all the way to the irreversible flows of life. I think it isn't a big reach, him having spent quite some time with uh, both Julia Pigurgin and Isabelle Sanger in Brussels to connect this notion of irreversibility that is part of its transversality to their work in irreversibility of biochemical systems. And I think this shows, you know, they show at least how the harnessing of chemical bifurcations, irreversibly ground living processes, and thermodynamic flow. And so this big arch from kind of group psychiatry to, to thermodynamics and biochemistry, I think allows us to situate ourselves part of the systems we describe, crucially. Um, in terms of the situated living time. So I'm elaborating this further. I will dwell on, on, on these questions of correlation, causation, and co-emergence that you can kind of go philosophy of science uh, hardcore on, but suffice to say for now that I think this kind of living time flow provides a common ground in terms of our epistemologies within living process. And I could say that's a carrier bag for environmental commitments that emphasize spatial proximity and temporal specificity of living process. And so this kind of apparatus that I'm sketching out for you, this big arc, um, provides a possibility for situated emergence, offers a generative pathway that is life affirming and moves us toward thinking as environment from within uh, modern scientific practice. Yet it's undeniably still part of a Western cosmology. Um, and for me, then the question is how to understand this kind of apparatus within a decolonial cosmology of practice. The question is how we can work through or diffract with other ways of knowing that are parts of different cosmologies. And so, for this, I've turned to Babaka Gantri Collective, um, whose indigenous geographies, I think, in many ways, are very close to this kind of pathway, this kind of apparatus of discussion. But there's also a catch. Um, I think that for me, you know, Babaka Gantri, for those of you, who, who know them and their work, really brought forward that what thinking as environment can be outside of Western cosmologies. As a collaboration by their own works of Aboriginal knowledge holders and settler colonial Ibanese, their work discusses knowledge in terms of land based practices as country that seem intimately tied to these irreversible flows of life and to a mode of performativity that one could say renders transversality a skinship. And yet, as this slide kind of gestures to, um, I'm unsure about how to take up this work, directly or otherwise. Um, and this halting is akin to this kind of foreclosure that I talked about with this proposition of, of thinking as environment, which might be a slightly over abstract way of putting it. So I'm simply going to quote the back country for you for now to kind of bring you to the edge of my thinking. First on, on, on becoming a country and then on, on, the, on the performativity of song spiral. So uh, read with me now. Country includes humans, more than humans, and all that is tangible and non-tangible, in which we come together 
an active, sentient, mutually caring, and multidirectional manner in, with, and as space. We argue that more than humans and humans co become as place in space in deep relation to all the diverse co becomings that also constitute it. Then, with song spirals, these bring country into existence. Song spirals are rich and multi layered articulations passed down through the generations and sung by the older people to break country, to make and remake the life giving connections between people and place. People co becoming as place. <laughs> so, you know, where does Bogart, Foucault, Haraway, or Vitalty? I would have no trouble, per se, working with their or your thoughts. And yet, with Bogart country, I hesitate. And I wonder, what is this unease? Why don't they just get on with it and take up the brilliant scholarship? And I think this goes beyond this hesitance exceeds like white guilt. I think something else is going on that speaks to this question of taking as environment, to the material and ethical complexity of cosmological encounters in irreversible and material time flows. I think I hesitate because this encounter expands what Stacey Alimo calls epistemological space as ethical space. This expansion exceeds the text. As manifested by the situated knowledges, knowledge practices of Bhavak, which raise issues of propriety, who can perform or convey what knowledge in which context, as well as the navigation of mutual obligation. Given the struggles for given that struggles for land rights and sovereignty are an integral part of these knowledge practices. And so this image of a land rights treaty. Uh, surrounded by clan designs invoking country, the agency of song struggles, illustrates a multiplication of material and ethical formative dimensions in this encounter. And I think this slows down declarations of solidarity um, and the risk of appropriation they might carry. The extension, by the way, importantly, also plays out. Um, in the climate movement right now, where we kind of see uh, this question of how different modes of solidarity almost there. Um, how these encounters of the problem of whether these encounters of different modes of solidarity might not lead to war and domination. So, in this expanded space, I wonder what responsibilities do I, do I take on in working with Ladakh County? And I sense that this encounter with them does not call for doing good, but for receiving well. And with that, I think purposive agency continues to be arrested. No spear will strike its target during this talk. Uh, perhaps this hesitation as a form of precaution can itself be a starting point for thinking as environment to avoid destructive zero points as we explore nonviolent practices. Of color the last uh, in the first part of the day. Hello. Um, I'm Ricardo Vela, a PhD candidate here at TIGO. Very grateful to be here. And to you in a nutshell, uh, my work, which uh, addresses the complex relationship between rural housing and cold war air condensation in the Venezuelan Amazon. A complex relationship that might stand at the root of the social and environmental problems that dominate the region today. Because rural housing, as part of a series of nation building projects deeply viewed with the ideology of modernization, was used as an instrument for controlling tropical diseases or improving the quality of life in the countryside, and also for asserting national territorial sovereignty in frontier regions during the 1960s and 1970s. By then, Venezuela had come to the forefront of the global debate on tropical disease control, its efforts 
sanitary efforts in the countryside have proven to be extremely successful to the point that more than 70% of the national territory had been declared malaria-free by the World Health Organization in 1961. Its strategy had three main ingredients, an aggressive PDT spraying campaign, the provision of rural aquifers and sewage systems, and the modernization of rural housing. And this is because scientists believe that traditional building techniques were at the origin of the severe epidemics decimating rural populations, contributing to the abandonment of agriculture and to the rural to urban migrations that were changing the country's demographics. So under the modernizing lens, the architects of the malariology division working for the Ministry of Health had an important civilizing task. And soon, the war against malaria also became the battle against traditional architecture. Venezuela's success in the global stage and the architects of the malariology division, a reputation as efficient agents of modernization in rural areas. And so in the context of the agrarian reform supported by the US government and aimed at including living conditions in the countryside to mitigate the spread uh, of the communist threat, of a belief communist threat, they were invited to collaborate with the National Agrarian Institute uh, in a series of integrated development projects for the countryside based on Israeli ideas of rural development. This technical expertise now expanded with Israeli concepts and methods um, was brought south of the Orinoco River to assist in the colonization of the Venezuelan Amazon between 1969 and 1974. But while in the north of the country, they were eradicating malaria and democratizing the agrarian structure. Here, they were helping to assert the presence of the state along its borders, and they were also incorporating the region's natural resources into the national economy. The National Agrarian Institute developed five integrated development projects with indigenous populations. And in parallel, the Ministry of Public Works launched another colonizing project pompously called the Conquest of the South, in direct reference to the American conquest of the West. A local ecology was impoverished through the imposition of a foreign one coming from Western colonial logics, just like an old growth forest is replaced by a scientific productive one by a monoculture, by a plantation. And the ideology of modernization could justify the colonizing actions of the state in many ways and different scales. Border lands had to be protected, uh, insects had to be controlled, a new rural society had to be created. As you can see, it was very difficult, if not impossible, to establish a dialogue with such a self opinion logic. In short, Modernization provided the desire for nation building. It built a technical expertise to bring development. His expertise designed a specific kind of technology, and this technology was brought to incorporate the region and its populations into the spaces of capitalist production. State-built rural housing is now a fact of life in the region, and it is estimated that by the end of the 1990s, there were already around 2,000 rural houses in the state of Amazonas alone, many more in the states of Delta Mapura and Bolivia. And the imposition of this technology helped to accelerate new forms of social and environmental change. Indigenous populations were disengaged from their traditional building techniques. Kinship structures were weakened by introducing a house designed for a Western nuclear family, for a Christian family. And uh, peasants were made through sedentism. But it also generated distinctive forms of creative resistance and generative living. Many of these houses were subsequently appropriated by indigenous peoples, and mutations took place to better adapt them to local climates and lifestyles. Most of these houses today are used as storage spaces, to indigenous dwellings that are built next to them or at the back of the plot, where social life actually takes place nowadays. <clears throat> so a critical examination of this moment in history will expose local histories and challenge official narratives of nation building efforts. But more importantly, and to go beyond just lamenting a vanished past, something that will never come back, we, I mean, this work has the potential to 
see colonization as a struggle indigenous peoples have stayed with. And if we manage to do so, we can start to see the appropriation of state built rural housing as a history of still possible, still possible recuperation and resurgence. Today, Malaya has made a deadly and dramatic comeback um, in Venezuela, especially in the Venezuelan Amazon. And the Anopheles mosquito is once again uh, a protagonist. Gold mining is devastating the forest and it's creating the conditions for the disease to thrive. Um, and because nature keeps being separated from society, the chances of making the same mistakes again is very high. But the indigenous hybrids I have presented overcome the oppositional logic separating the traditional from the modern, the natural from the cultural worlds. There are valuable lessons to be learned there. I believe that if we are to face the challenges brought by what we call the Anthropocene, uh, we must develop that kind of response ability that indigenous peoples have painfully matured over centuries in relation to the colonial inheritance. But uh, differences matter. So I wonder what conditions are needed to develop that kind of responsibility outside of an indigenous ecology. Thank you. Well, I invite uh, the six speakers to the podium. I'd like to give a chance to Rosie for an immediate response. Thank you. Yeah. Andre, thank you, everybody, uh, for this opportunity to actually not so much to respond, but to say something uh, about uh, my project uh, with my team at the Institute in Rotterdam and reach out for this wonderful team here in Delft with enormous thanks for uh, the space and time you're giving to me and my work. Um, blessedly, I escaped from academe last year due to retirement, but even previously, um, I visited and researched the university resonated deeply with my passion for the critical post-humanities, new ways of creating knowledge. And I was very fortunate in being invited by the new institute to set up a new project called the Knowledge Academy, which is mapping alternative ways of knowledge production in the space of the city, urban-based knowledge practices in a very transversal manner that resonates with everything I've done um, before. Um, and I'm very blessed to have my leading researcher here today. Anya, are you in the audience? Please stand and become with Anna Molenda, who's carrying this project with grace and enormous confidence. Thank you so very much. Why the city? Because it is a manageable space. I mean, it's not exactly the world, and it's not the ivory tower of Axie. It's actually doable. Um, and after the official end of globalization, relocalization of knowledge or production, whatever that means, but it is happening, makes urban conglomerates and much more interesting, even in this old continent. And they have been, of course, central to the American uh, space time continuum. But you know, we are talking about now a knowledge economy that stretches from this city, at least to Cologne, but I would say Vladivostok, probably, uh, to be honest, with rivers and waterways as the great carriers. So Rotterdam is just not a city. This is the biggest port on earth alongside Shanghai. <laughs> uh, and it is an incredible observatory to see how advanced capitalism is reinventing itself. And trust me, it is reinventing itself fast. Uh, and if you work with the Deleuzean notions of re-territorialization and deterritorialization, and if you have as allies from the New Institute, take Delft with an architecture a faculty which has been Deleuze in among the lecture. Thank you, the Andre. Well, you are sitting on a, on a, actually on a, on a rock, yes, really, um, uh, to track the relentless capacity of the system for flows and mutations and self interested survival, staggering. So, we are trying to focus on how the green economy impacts on the port, but somewhat does not impact on the city as much. Does Rotterdam really have a city? 
Oh, is it just a book? Is the poet of Rotterdam on earth? Could be another question for our distinguished <laughs> guest. <laughs> or is it reorganized itself in alliance with Elon Musk to actually work with Mars? Uh, I think Elon Musk did say something about shooting his rockets from Iceland, if I remember correctly. So they would land in Iceland and come here around the corner. You're on a waterway in Rotterdam that takes you all the way to Switzerland. From Switzerland, you have the railways ready to follow you on here in Vladivostok. Who has understood this? China has understood this, of course. <laughs> so this is just not any city. Uh, it's, it's an observatory. And I, and I must say that there are days when I go home thinking, yes, we've got it. We've been able to map the re-territorialization of capital. And there are other days when I go home, I think, too late, open the concept of bubble. Let's just get lost, but we can't do it. The theoretical framework uh, is my critical posthumanism uh, that occupied the last 12 years of my existence. I really had not planned to, but it took over uh, with a trilogy of books that built on each other to try to understand what kind of subject we are becoming. I am very much a philosopher of subjectivity, and my alliance with both the architects and practitioners and the visionary minds, um, like my ancestor, Donna Haraway, is based on my firm belief that we need philosophies of the subject. This is where I'm not an SDS, a science and technology person. This is where I will never be a Latourian, not if you pay me for zillions. We need <laughs> epistemology, we need subjectivity, because without subjectivity, there is no politics, there is no ethical accountability, <laughs> and it is really too easy to take act and act of theory, the boys, object ontologies, and wipe the floor of critical theory with it. We don't need subjectivity. Who needs feminism? Who needs anti-racism? Who needs the decolonial? Give me a few more system theories. And a lot of posthumanism is affected by this. This is why I came in saying, thank you, boys. Whatever happened to feminism? Whatever happened to LGBT theories? Whatever happened to anti-fascist theory, anti-racist theory? Now we don't need theory. Are we interesting? We don't, huh? Too easy. So critical question is as a critique of that in alliance, because it is true. I, I don't, you know, I'm not from biology. I'm from philosophy. I think this is an unbelievable archetype, but it needs to get into dialogue with a few other forces. So I, I, working hypothesis for my work transposed into the Knowledge Academy into uh, the new institute in alliance with Delft, we have here the convergence of the forces that produce, on the one hand, um, the force um, uh, industrial revolution, an industrial revolution led by technology. You name your technologies, here we are, the hub of technological brilliance. Uh, fourth industrial revolution intersecting the sixth extinction of the species of the planet. And it's not as if the fourth industrial revolution happens on Tuesday morning and the sixth extinction on Friday afternoon. They happen at the same time. And they cause together a conflagration of social economic inequality and dispossession, a polarization of wealth, which is larger than the first industrial revolution. As a reminder, the first industrial revolution is Charles Dickens and Karl Marx. We are worse. The accumulation of wealth today is worse, free, kickety, and open the second bottom of the second. So how do we, within the intersecting forces of the advanced technologies and that advanced depletion of the planet with an extreme inequality and injustice that the death is causing? What kind of subjects are we becoming? Or are we all dying silently, mentally, spiritually? Uh, are we gone already? China thinks we are. China thinks the West is doomed. China thinks our, our life force has gone. We are yesterday's news. We are the decadent. And, uh, Pax Americana gone dead. And that's who we are. What well, are we? That's the working question. And we are going to go into the city, working with people, trying to say, figure out, uh, mapping out the modes of knowledge production that are being activated really on the floor. Uh, whether it is you know, startups, whether it is the, the, the communities of artists and designers, whether it is actually culinary, uh, spotting alternatives. Um, and we're asking ourselves, how can a city like Rotterdam, um, with the wealth of knowledge, not think of itself as a cognitive hub? Why is Rotterdam fire Nord populism, ignorance, 72% migration, and nothing. Um, and all the knowledge seems to be in Amsterdam. I know you guys are always doing this deal. You take this, I take this. But it's a peculiar representation of the city. And because the 
the uh, institute has an enormous wealth of architectural archive. We are looking at plans of the city. Now, actually, the city has been thought through uh, very carefully, but people who inhabit the city don't think of themselves as knowledge players. I mean, actually, they don't think of themselves as anything. And parked here under the eyes of um, capital, so to speak. So in doing this, we want to look at how the long shadows of humanism and anthropocentrism still affect the way in which we map both knowledge and city spaces. And humanism and anthropocentrism, critiques of humanism and critiques of anthropocentrism are central to uh, my theory of posthumanism. We need to look at the language in which we express our critique. We need to look at the modes and forms of design of the Arnold practices. We need to reflect on how this man of reason inhabits even the most critical of our activities. And the critique of humanism and anthropocentrism intersect, but they're not the same thing. That is a video you can both. They don't automatically follow from each other. Example, you can do animal rights and be perfectly, completely humanist. We just think Martha Nussbaum. Um, you can do critical theory in any of its variations and only care for the suffering of underprivileged humans. And you can go to the other side and do transhumanism. John Lovelock, I'm sorry, not a great fan of his dear Bruno, complete transhumanism and re-establish humanistic principles. Lovelock said, I am actually accomplishing the European Enlightenment. I'm out of there immediately. And European Enlightenment, men of reason, colonialism, women out, just you know, wiping out years and years and years of feminist, anti-racist, decolonial critiques of humanism. Complexity is the complexity of this approach that we can actually explore in the Knowledge Academy with the help of the, of the new institute that has incredible resources and incredible people asking what kind of subject are we in the process of becoming, knowing that we are not one and the same, knowing that the ferocity of advanced capitalism and its ability to reinvent itself is pulling the human apart, leaving us with a heap of galleries uh, that we need to recompose. And do we, how do we do that? How do we re resist this process? I was very, very impressed by the papers and that I heard so far. And I want to thank Mirto, Johanna, Molly, Yere, Kristen, Ricardo for exploring different aspects of this growth and this recomposition of the landscape, offering original, bold perspective, materially grounded. I am a Deleuze materialist feminist. I will die a materialist feminist. <laughs> In fact, I don't intend to that, but I will uh, theoretically use materially grounded, immense vitality, affirmative force. I mean, in each of the papers, there was an intent to the, we can do it, we can go on. Uh, critical theory together with the, 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 the hope of intelligence, uh, the optimism uh, of the mind and the body. Last remark. Architecture, always a forum. I remember when Foucault's philosophy was taught by Asimov Kachari at the Architecture Institute in Venice before anybody else had understood that Foucault was going to be a master. It always has been, together with anthropology, you're kind of the jollies in the pack. It's always been a forum. I heard, and I'm here, reports of something called the architectural posthumanities and coming up. Um, and how interested are we in the Knowledge Academy in an alliance with critical architectural posthumanities where we would be looking at the different modalities um, of knowledge, production, looking at the language and uh, looking at what we can make of this affirmatively, critically together. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. This is wonderful. Uh, we, we were wondering if you would be willing to shift in front for the sake of the camera. Uh, this is the panel. Sure. Let's I have to, to, to sit well. Uh, oh, the way there. Yeah. 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 We have uh, yeah. some questions in case they need to be reminded about the. Uh, I think you are, whatever it is, it's, uh, 
questions and uh, right on of course uh, at this point we have you know some of our questions and uh, we imagine that anybody in fact has you know the panel itself but also that we're not talking after the as you know big aliens as well okay. I am struck by uh, so many things in these papers that, that pull them together uh, in ways that really matter to me. Uh, the, the thick, committed location of each of these inquiries um, in what's actually happening in the world in complicated ways that are deeply conditioned by the histories of imperialism and colonialism and conquering of the land, but are doing something else creatively, the dredged Rhine, the kind of Nakba of the river, or the extraordinary um, strengthening uh, of the of the river that is then uh, transmuted into a kind of project of walking the river otherwise now uh, with a particular bird, a particular fish, a particular insect uh, in its waterways and the actual material practices of walking the, walking the water is itself a kind of remarkable image um, that uh, need not be related to Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. Anyway, we, we need to go there. Uh, that kind of, uh, it, it, the dredging of the Rhine is irreversible, but uh, the turning of uh, rural Venezuela into the location of a, of a poor peasantry in a system of capitalist extraction is irreversible, but uh, the housing is uh, repurposed with dwellings for actual sociality and the storage place. There's a there's a remarkable built metaphor in turning that uh, that housing for colonizing the interland into places of storage uh, in, in many senses. The the ways that um uh, the I should be able to do this more quickly the um the kinds of drawings uh, that we see in, in uh, each of these presentations. So the practice of drawing and designing and proposing and representing as a memory practice that is also a way of imagining possible nows. What now is actually possible? What are we in? Which brings us to something like the storylines of uh, and the story spirals of the of Yonu, but in a way that asks about what the difference is between appropriation and solidarity, and whether solidarity can be, become yet another kind of self healing for the Western observer, or is there a kind of learning and a, is there is a kind of solidarity possible that does something else? in these relentless contact zones that are so power fraught, so that you bring these um, representations framed by the clan designs into the court to establish certain kinds of rights over property and water and land and movement and residence and so on, but they're brought into a court that operates out of different categories and yet mutates the categories in the very presentation of a kind of document that is a storyline that does accountability to country otherwise. So uh, how to be come with, to be for and with each other um, in ways that don't, uh, it, we can't help, I can't help but repeat my own histories and yet otherwise, and also my own histories as a Western knowledge a person formed in Western knowledge practices can't be demonized as my own interior other. Uh, so that what kinds of engagement with, uh, what kinds of accountabilities to genealogies, to heritages, surely that is one of the questions 
uh, provoked by having an archive, as well as mutating that archive. So rather than go on, um, I think that the kind of, the way I'm moved collectively by the presentations is by their, their materialist, concrete, uh, materializing worlding uh, with highly, I mean, the, the, the Rhine is highly contaminated. It's only, that's both the reality and a metaphor for living, the way Anna Singh puts it, is living on a damaged planet. Uh, how, to, how to live well on a damaged planet that makes it, maybe it's a question that the, the storylines ask, how to leave country less damaged, not more damaged than one receives it. How to face the ancestors rather than face the future. The way the Yonu might phrase it is that a responsible person faces those who came before so as to leave a less damaged country to those who will come after who you cannot see. We're not facing the future in the way of the blissed out, uh, you know, a, a sun blinded, uh, objective lower called man. Uh, so each of these papers provokes me to re inhabit that question and to re inhabit the archive that way. And the rant. The rant of the plan. Who goes? Where do you want to Yes. Maybe we can also ask questions to each other. Yeah, make a yeah. panel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, hard to reply to this, but I, I think it's super nice how you um, brought these papers somehow also into relation, which I think um, one of the most beautiful things also for us to be part uh, of this panel and get to know each other's work that somehow speaks to each other. And I think for me, one of the um, most <laughs> inspiring ones was actually your paper, because then I, I probably have to go back uh, to what you said, which was um, when you were talking about um, the air in the carrier bag, and when you were saying that this is actually what, what makes, um, what does the work. And I was immediately thinking somehow of what I'm trying to do when, when I'm speaking about the milieu, which I think is somehow something that maybe many of us talk about that or make explicit in a certain way, which is not somehow focusing on, on one particular story, but somehow how, how different things connect and how we can somehow approach the idea of an environment uh, in a different manner. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm always humbled by, um, I, I tend to, you know, the the heritage of the sky people that did still in me as a philosopher, so that I tend to fly off if I don't, uh, if I'm not careful. So, of course, that was the theme of my talk, but I'm very appreciative of your grounded work uh, and, and, the, and also the graphic, uh, you know, the, 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 the Klasse in the overflow, the scratching the surface of things that you're doing in sense, um, which I which I really love. Um, and what struck me in in, in both uh, your uh, presentations just now, both on the level of critique and on the level of um, things that are already the case. So you know how to live well on a damaged planet is one of the most beautiful questions I've heard. But the presumption that that planet that the that damage is now um, complete somehow, or that we uh, understand the scope of the damage, or even the tempos, uh, uh, the accelerating tempos, the, the types of acceleration involved in that damage, um, raises for me the question of, well, you know, to what extent can we observe that? Uh, that is witnessing enough zero points, what I, what I love about it, and what you absolutely don't do in your work as presented, uh, describes the, uh, the observer that can observe without being observed, right? And, and I guess this is the, the eternal feedback loop that theoreticians are, are, are grappling with somehow. Um, but this raises for me this question of facing uh, our ancestors or rediscovering the fact that we are, we have ancestors and we're able to face them in, in all their broad and complex and also often tough histories. Um, but at the same time, being in this roller coaster, this kinetic, like, Planets in disruption. The, the whole planet is, you know, the whole Holocene is 
is a jar, one could say, but to what? So that would be my question. Um, no, thank you. Um, I, I um, this idea of also facing the ancestors uh, resonates greatly, and uh, especially when one thinks that um, when one thinks of the lessons we need to learn from indigenous peoples, taking into consideration why what Ayanta Pena or Enrique Dulce or Vidal uh, de Castro have said in many occasions that. You know, indigenous peoples, have been, at least in the Americas, have been living in the end of the world for over 500 years. And they have managed, in a way, to inherit this, uh, stay with it, or be forced to do so. And yeah, 500 years is a long time, in a way. No, it's, uh, we're just, you know, we're beginning to realize uh, this uh, challenge that is. Ahead. But it, yeah, indeed, it's, 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 it's uh, the idea of actually taking the inheritance and, 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 and facing uh, what has been yeah given to us. It's, it's, it's something that really resonates. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this input. But another thing that I, I just wanted to just an anecdote that, uh, I mean, that resonates is that it's funny to see how from the Venezuelan Amazon to the Rhine, the mosquito was in both cases a big protagonist. <laughs> both cases in different parts of the world, uh, this idea of malaria, uh, something that had to be controlled and uh, something that had to be uh, dealt with uh, yeah, in very devastating ways is also interesting. Uh, and this also resonates with uh, your work here because one of the things I have learned is that these ideas of controlling malaria by, you know, dealing so aggressively with nature was actually the result of networks of expertise traveling through the world from Italy to Venezuela, from Italy to Egypt, from Egypt to the United States, Rockefeller Foundation, coming to Venezuela, bringing people from all over the world just to bring an expertise on how to kill mosquitoes, you know, <laughs> on how to kill insects. Yeah. I will leave malaria to Donna. I will. <laughs> um, only indigenous issue, and um, speaking as an Italian Australian, great to see the issue coming up uh, and it's terribly important. And Vivian de Castro, of course, leading, but uh, Australian Aboriginals out there who chairs and work for decades in Australia. Vivian de Castro is very critical, of course, of Anthropocene discourse, as we all are, for being Eurocentric a massive attack of white panic. Um, however, he's also an affirmative thinker. Um, he is a Deleuze scholar. Um, he attended a Deleuze seminar together with a Descola, myself, and many others. And in all of his books, he offers immediately the milieu, the middle ground for the Alliance. And the Alliance is the sections of continental philosophy that are materialist, grounded, accountable and perspectivist. Perspectivism has a very distinguished tradition in our, in our history of philosophy. And like this, the, the nomads are the monads in reversal. I mean, Andre and I have been making up jokes for decades. And Spinoza, the Jewish Dutch genius, and uh, Nietzsche, and the lovers himself. Feminist politics of location, you speak from somewhere uh, in, in particular, don't do the god tricks that my ancestor Haraway. Be grounded. Yes. <laughs> well, but you are, you are but genealogically, you train me, you train all of us. Uh, and I do this as an act of uh, respect and, 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 and uh, acknowledgement of everything you've given us. Um, so you can make an alliance. You can go back to the future by revisiting the chapters of your tradition, which philosophy departments ignore. Because they only do the H's, they know that Hegel, Heidegger, himself. <laughs> and the three H's versus all the materials that, that nobody teaches Spinoza. And if you do it, like in Europe, philologically oriented, textually grounded, they think that the last take on this is crap, and then it goes up again. So make alliances within what we've got. Second point in Asara, indigeneity. We have shares of indigeneity in Europe. 
We are the indigenous populations in Europe. Uh, they're up the Arctic Pole, they're, they're in Lapland, in Norway, very distinguished professors working on what the, the melting of the permafrost means for the indigenous population. So you don't have to go walk about and go orientalist, stay grounded, look in our backyard, and we can bring indigeneity right here. It's not very far away, but just not used to think uh, of people about the Arctic Pole. Malaria. <laughs> <laughs> well, Malaria, apparently that's my assignment. <laughs> which, um, first, the degree to which extraordinary authoritarianisms have been justified by the attack on disease should be uh, should be in the foreground of our thinking, the basis of what we've been hearing, and surely just coming uh, into relationship with the virus, with the many COVID viruses, and the really extraordinary inventions of forms of social control. Uh, around this virus, perhaps most prominently uh, attempted in China, really interesting uh, social engineering around the COVID virus uh, with a really stunning failure resulting in multi millions of rapid death uh, when the controls are lifted. Really fascinating, coupled with our neglect of masks, uh, including my own right here in this room, which is probably really stupid. Um, but remembering also that in my own institution, the University of California at Davis, the contemporary war against malaria is most certainly being pursued with the sterile female research and with the use of the um, CRISPR gene technologies to produce uh, in, um, technologized mosquitoes for continuing the war against malaria uh, versus the question of how to make friends with malaria or at least how to make friends with the mosquitoes and what kinds of natural cultural social ecologies uh, have been in place might be a re, uh, re, uh, re, re, not reinvented, but, but re-engaged and perhaps improved uh, for less depth of humans and other animals that live with each other in subsistence really in relations of, of eating. Okay. Um, so not to glorify or, or uh, uh, some kind of mythical traditional past when dying was supposedly okay. Uh, and malaria is just a nice thing. How to, how to think about what conditions promote these kinds of virulent malarias and, and other uh, disease. We live in an extremely pathogen-friendly advanced capitalist world uh, where the proliferation of pathogens and wars on pathogens is the, the game. Um, it's, it's very much part of the uh, continual gestification of the further technologization of our world, um, even as we are inventing and spreading new pathogens all the time as opposed to reimagining uh, livable ecologies. I mean, there are lots of people that are doing that, which actually brings me to a question about the freedom to build, um, and which I'm really, I'm really struck by that um, in terms of the list of adding to the list of fundamental freedoms. Mind you, I am not against rights and freedoms and subjectivities and a whole lot of supposedly bad categories. Um, you know, uh, these are contaminated categories that I'm not willing to put in the wastebasket. And I think the right to build is a really integral freedom to build. You call it freedom, not right, because it's in the anarchist tradition, which isn't so much about rights as it is about freedoms. And I spent part of August in an agricultural squatting collective of collectives in that Calgary in Lyon, um, where, where repurposed building and re wasteland and various kinds of urban agriculture united with migrant communities, right, needs for food, um, extraordinary uh, ongoing uh, building of, of community. They aren't experiments. They're actually living. They aren't experiments before we're living in some other time. It's actually living now in the deep tradition of European squatter communities, deeply connected to the history of anarchism with the right to build through repurposed materials that will send any fire inspector you know, to the local and same as I at the residence. Coming from California, was I afraid of fire sleeping in the midst of that scrub brush and these, these, these buildings? I tell you, had there been fire, there would have been mass death. It's a simple fact. So how to bring together uh, the kinds of planning against avoidable disaster, but with these kinds of freedoms for exuberant and unsafe ways of living. Uh, I think the, the, the questioning of how much freedom of what, how much safety and of what kind and for whom, both human and, and more than human, 
which kinds of thistles uh, ought to be encouraged and which kinds of thistles maybe, maybe ought to be suppressed, in which meadows, and what's the boundary between a lawn and a meadow? Uh, pollinator friendly landscaping out there, uh, well, at least around the new institute in, in Rotterdam, probably here too. I saw all kinds of efforts to make pollinator friendly plantings around the buildings. Uh, it's really great. Uh, and I, I, I think of them as interrogative practices, which plants and animals are invited in and which kinds are evicted. Uh, I'm not sure this is a list of questions so much as a, a list of provocations that you guys provoked for me. Maybe I, if, if you pause someone else can also talk, but I have a, a quick response because I think, I mean, what you bring out and also this idea of like who is invited in and like who, and also what you were saying about like how can we make friends with mosquitoes? And I, I mean, I have these three animals for, for most of the reasons, but one of them is really hated by humans. One is kind of super unnecessary and ignored, which is this bird, nobody cares so much. And then there's the salmon, which is the absolute like favorite of everybody. It's like the sympathetic megafauna for, for, for driving ecological restoration. And I think when I was starting to write the mosquito chapter, I was like, oh, it's it's really difficult because I don't know what's why would you like them? There is actually it's super difficult to find empathy and to kind of somehow be with mosquitoes and understand um what do they bring? But then I think it's maybe also trying to understand uh, what these species can help us uh, open up to understand about the environment and about different places, and especially working with people that, I mean, in a certain way, care for the mosquitoes, not necessarily in, in their own interest, but they have a connection to, to the nature there. And they, there was one person talking to me about the fact that I mean, managing mosquito populations also means uh, uh, that people can access these water watery places, and that makes them maybe like them more and maybe care more about all the other place, all the other species that might be there. So it's it's a, it's a kind of balance that I find um, quite interesting. And I mean, what, maybe one more thing on the mosquitoes is that obviously at the time of the running straightening, nobody knew that there were mosquitoes. It was about somehow improving the climate or like making creating somehow a milieu that is favorable for humans and not favorable um, for others. People haven't spoken yet. Um yes, I don't know how to start. I have so many questions and so many thoughts right now. It's very difficult to focus. But starting from what you said, Johanna if I'm saying it correctly. I would say that I always find it uh, very interesting in string figures, how most of the times the things that we find uh, disgusting or unlikable, they have the most interesting stories in indigenous mythologies and philosophies. And, and I have in mind, for example, the spider or the medusa in the Greek philosophy and Greek. So, this is my case in my limit, in a sense. And yes, they have the most interesting stories and the way they are demonized are actually the way to move forward to a different context where uh, the prevailing uh, powers, they point out in another direction. And I really like Barat, also Karen Barat, and her notion of this agential cut both in the process of knowing and also in the process of engaging with the world. So I think that when we choose these stories, that they're not necessarily likable and that they also have this dying factor in them, also the volcano, malaria. I mean, we usually have them in mind as something negative, but then they are actually the ones in power to rewrite the, the story of how we live today. And for me, I know that you don't really like the notion of Sinatos, right? But oh, I think mean, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is coming right up. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, I don't know, necropolitics and necropower are actually something that I'd really like to bring on the table of our conversation today. Well, 
Sorry, I, I don't know why you think I, I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. That is interested in me, so it's not. Um, <laughs> so I know I've, I've written a, a lot about this in all the, in all the books on the, on the posthuman, and I have this chapter, my chapter on death is in transposition. Chapter five in transposition is really the affirmative ode to death and doing death as the event, which has always already happened. It's not before you, it's, it's, it makes you mortal. Uh, the moment you're inscribed into time, you're inscribed into death. I don't want to go into all of that because it's boring philosophy, but it's very much a present concern. Uh, and the uh, ethics of affirmation is not the denial of death and mourning and loss, it's a way of processing it. And it's believing that the processing of it is pure Spinoza, ethics of joy, it's the hard labor to process and transform. It's a practice. It, it requires a community, it's hard work, it's interminable, as Press Freud would say, but it is the way to forge values. It's a critique of dominant morality, which is blah, blah, blah protocol. And I think so, affirmation and hope is the labor, the hard work of crafting together a values that we need to get on with it, using our brains for survival. Think in our way for release. I think John, you just leaped up. Is that a leaping? Yeah, yeah, but after you. No, I'm done. <laughs> I want to make sure that it, the students haven't spoken. Oh, I'm not in the chair. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm thinking about, uh, of course, about last night, Lynn Margaret says, bacteria don't die. Uh, and the bio vitality. Then, and in some really perverse sense, uh, the foundation of living entities themselves don't die. This is not fair. But I'm thinking of the difference between that mat of cyanobacteria and a lawn. A lawn is a certain kind of death dealing machine. And that map of cyanobacteria with those little bubbles of oxygen and that ooze that is like vomit that doesn't die in the sense that, that, that critters like ourselves most certainly do raises a whole set of possible figurations. They're thinking politically, thinking subjectivities, I don't know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I really wanted to comment on was seamounts. Um, because uh, that's the, the uh, geomorph, that's the landform. It hasn't yet quite explicitly, it's been submerged underneath our discussion, but the seamount is rising as the volcano, volcano is layering and layering and layering, and then the seamount is subsiding. Uh, seamounts are particularly interesting ephemeral landforms that are particularly critical to both inhabiting, figuring, being responsible, in the current world as uh, the sea of islands submerges in the Pacific, but also elsewhere. And the beings, the people, and the more than humans of these islands uh, are themselves subjected to these risings and fallings. So I was really struck by the power of the seamount, both as an actual land form, land, land water form, set of processes, uh, and wanted to ask you to uh, how you how you um, uh, expand how you connect to your thinking about the seamounts in the Mediterranean how that figures uh, uh, questions for you. Um, so for me, actually, the, this this is process, but also my process of becoming. So I didn't start from the seamounts, I discovered the seamounts, yes. And that was a very important discovery for Not me. by running a ground on them at a point. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's one way to discover it. <laughs> yeah, that would be nothing though. And then after realizing how they work uh, and how interesting they are of symptoms of disruption, and in this agential cut that I was referring to before, I wanted to see how we can uh, use the processes uh, of water to also introduce more ephemeral terms in the way we are inhabiting the world now. And uh, to somehow, that's why I'm calling it a string figure, because it guides, in my perspective, towards a different way of living. And uh, a way of living that is really connected to death. And this month that I chose is exactly in the Strait of Sicily, in this very dangerous uh, route for migration between Libya and uh, Sicily, in fact. And it's one of the reasons that this region is actually so dangerous. 
because of all the volcanoes and all the salts and all the sea mounts that are found there. I'm very keen on this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's much to think about, and I think yesterday um, the, this bacterial mat resonated with my investigation on lawns very clearly in, in the sense of thinking about landscapes as um, as continuous um, temporal and spatial assemblages that that have that hold and contain so many stories that some of which we can um, we can uh, read more easily than others and uh, and also, it, it really questions at the, at the so this the 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 images of Lynn Margulis touching um, the the slime and uh, the, it's it's this embodiment of 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 uh, of actually engaging with the disgustingness of it, perhaps but with the or and the beauty, yeah, absolutely of of. Um, of this condition that we're, we're living in. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, perhaps it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the bodily, um, our bodies and the bodies of others in this landscape and in this match is, uh, that, that's our, con that's one of our connections is really through touching and engaging and getting messy. Um, well, I don't really know what I'm saying with this, but uh, <laughs> let's come. Um, maybe a careful stuff out of biology and So I'll make a careful step back from biology in my comfort zone before I'm planning another thing. But I actually wanted to comment on, on this idea that we can find indigenous cultures in Europe, just in remote places. And my reflection would be that we could find indigenous planning cultures in our cities, in our neighborhoods, in our surroundings. And this idea of uh, damaged planets is massively due to the damaged Western culture. Uh, damaged West, but also what I liked about our old presentation is this affirmation that it can be repaired, it can be reconsidered as a different type of um, engaging with different kind of questions on how do we live on this planet and how do we live together, and how do we collaborate, how we engage with empathy, with solidarity, with all these things that are somehow imminent to us, but the toxic kind of addiction to capitalism, to wealth accumulation, to to segregation, uh, racial inequalities, and feminism, and all these kind of uh, questions are making us really distant from these exact values that are very cherished. And this idea of freedom to build and how people um, always find a way to, to ensure their needs through collaborative of social action and some type of fighting for pieces of autonomy within it. I'm very sure that every neighborhood in, in any European city you enter has not just squads but has actually communities that are facing our ancestors and the way how they created their kind of social and cultural values in a way that is un, unrelated to the toxic way of how we engage with capital on the West today. No? That's that would be my uh, first descent. Yeah. Now we have one more. Hey. No? Yes. Uh, so much has been said so far. So I think I only I, I can only bring it back to re-inhabiting the archive, right? And um, I think two images really really stick with me, and 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 I've tried to address them in the in the in introduction statement of uh, the sanitized archive, right? The long the place where um, no no life is brimming other than a monoculture, other than uh, a singular entity of knowledge, or the mat, the messiness, 
the dirtiness. And in a sense, this disgusting place, I would also call, you know, like the, I, I, I would call the institution such a place, like a place where all knowledge has come together, hopefully also a way to uh, uh, rethink the way that we uh, preserve knowledge and the way in which we stand on each other's shoulders, right? Not only as uh, facing our ancestors, but believing ourselves also as part of this ancestral lineage. I loved what you had to say about the messiness of the archive and asking what we preserve for whom and how and how to engage with it. And if I could make a connection, um, in my town of Santa Cruz at the university, there is an arboretum which is full of uh, plant, plants uh, from the so-called global south, from Madagascar, from New Zealand, from Australia, from South Africa, from the south of, Latin, uh, of South America, so forth and so on. All, of course, emblematic of an imperial archive, uh, transmuted into a local, absolutely fabulous arboretum. Um, but it's being, it's being repurposed that its offspring, the cuttings from these plants, are very much part of the contemporary freedom to build and re re reliving of local indigeneities, local uh, local making local, making making ourselves local in community as people rip out water hungry lawns and using cuttings from this imperial archive to produce these extraordinarily heterogeneous heterotopic um, yards that are full of plants from God knows where, and animals that are both local and not at all, but these mating flights of hummingbirds in the spring and these diving male hummingbirds into your plant from New Zealand. Um, it's an extraordinary enactment of living together in a messy archive uh, that is, that archive is constantly being redone in, the, in every city uh, uh, to remake communities in very interesting ways. Yeah. <laughs> because you just mentioned that, I would just want to highlight that TWL also has a botanical garden in that place. <laughs> it's a kind of history, of course, with let's say, a lot of plants that were used for you know, whatever plants could be used for in the colonies where scientists would study the collective. So, if it wouldn't be so fresh outside, I would advise you also to go there later. But what I would also like to think about in, let's say, the panel on posthumanism, and what I, what I found so fascinating with, let's say, all the presentations is um, how you all touched on, let's say, this aspect with these monocultures that you mentioned, and like the reduction that uh, modernization, in a sense, is enacting. And of course, I have to think also of Anatsing here as like a sort by man. Uh, the perpetual reproduction of impoverished ecosystems and how, let's say, our ecosystem is this impoverished ecosystem. And I just wonder because it's, it, has, it, it has this kind of weird component to it where we want to, with posthumanism, as, as Jose Guerra just says, we want to move beyond post anthropocentrism. We need to go beyond post anthropocentrism because who is the anthropos in this? No? And that, of course, we need different forms of thinking. But it seems like we have already, let's say, impoverished our intellectual ecosystem to such a point that it's very difficult to empathize with these others, become friends with mosquitoes, become friends with the ugliness of the slimes, and so on. And it's a real process of unlearning. And I'm wondering, maybe as a discussion point for the last uh, 50 minutes that we have, um, how we avoid the neo-humanism coming back, sneaking back into this by relearning this empathy, resorting maybe to the wrong kind of anthropos again, and at the same time, um, how to tool difference in this regard. So how how we tool our different situatednesses in there. Of course, we have an answer. Don't, don't let me start with this. <laughs> three minutes, because I could have talk for three hours. Uh, I'm going to say two utterly contradictory things. Um, the first one is that uh, neo-humanism is back through transhumanism. Uh, Nick Bostrom, Elon Musk really argue that they are perfecting humanity by merging it with the technology. It's the Silicon Valley now moved to Texas ethos. The human enhancement through technology is the next evolutionary leap. 
John Lovelock in the Nova Sea, the, the, the children of the current humanity will be the cyborg. Sorry, John. I'm not. I'm trying to vote. Uh, may they be merciful to us. Really, John? Honestly, really. So is there, and, and I think the, big, the biggest hypocrisy and the sleight of hand of the transhumanists is that they are analytically post anthropocentric, but no, normatively, they're neo humanists. So they're much worse than Peter Singh and Martha Nussbaum, great thinkers whom I respect enormously, who are openly humanistic and say, you know, we have to insert human values, human-centered AI. If I see that once again, I will kill myself. Human-centered AI, really, honestly, anyone would believe that one? Honest. Uh, so that sleight of hand is one of the great con jobs of the current economy. And then people panic because chat GPT is going to suppress 8 million uh, jobs, including our own. Uh, a little bit late, considering that you have actually destroyed the human under the heading of improving it. So that's the first one. And here we could go into any number of critiques from feminism, from uh, Black Studies. Then I'm going to turn this around and say that there are very many minoritarian traditions on non-Western humanism which have been claiming uh, their right to exist for decades. My lifelong conversation with Paul Gilroy, uh, his attachment to Franz Fanon, saying, uh, was quoting my attachment to Jean-Paul Sartre from the introduction to the wretched of the earth, says that humanism has been betrayed in the West. Betrayed in the concentration camps, I would add, betrayed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and before that, betrayed in the colonies and the imperial project. Dead, gone, hypocritical. It is not so in other parts of the world. Um, uh, not the Ubuntu, not African humanism, not Buddhist humanism, not Asian humanism. So humanism has a great future outside of the European project. But within the project of, of Western um, uh, humanism, I think is bankrupt. Uh, and in this, uh, really, I will never be uh, a more, an American moral philosopher. I think I think not. But enormous respect for all of them um, uh, and enormous recognition. No. No. And what about modernism? Uh, modernism is your chapter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm wondering because um, currently I am uh, st starting, or I have started a new project called Modernisms Along the Indian Ocean. Right, so um, I've been thinking a lot about the fact that modern or modernity might not mean the same as modernisms, and that we might be able to engage differently in the same way as. Um, I mean, Rosie just said about humanisms, right? And um, in a sense, a particular Western modernism has been imported into that region of the Indian Ocean. And um, vernaculars existed on the ground. Vernaculars came again into existence on the ground after merging and re-meeting again. Um, so yeah, how about, you know, like, uh, uh, in, in engaging with that a bit further, so that's that's a bit where I'm uh, where I'm at now, like reopening this particular archive. Yeah, wow, modernism. Um, so I guess like not staring in the sun uh, is a is a challenge in the humanistic modernist tradition. Um, for me, the conceptual problem I always kind of flirting a bit with Taoism, with the main Taoism, is this challenge of you know, what you put in the sun will grow. And, and so how, you know, like focusing on, on, on capitalist narratives and dynamics is, is incredibly important, but of course we are also, also platforming them in a sense. Um, and I find it's a very, very deep humanistic problem um, that we seem to uh, recur in uh, time and again, uh, to my great frustration and uh, sadness. And so this notion of complementarity, you know, I love this idea about in Dutch, you call it grazig grasland. So it's a typology of, of uh, terrain, grazing grass, which refers to the absence, you know, the grazer talks about the grass. So there's a certain relationality between the, the landscape and the grazer where the agent is actually deprioritized. It's about the landscape itself. Uh, and so for me, the search is how can you turn away from something and go into an affirmative and generative mode while understanding how that is also a decolonial, demodern 
practice. So you have to kind of not look at the thing you're trying to avoid while understanding how the thing you're doing will actually achieve a distance. And I think, I mean, would other humanisms be able to do that in other regions and other traditions? Probably I hope so, but, but um, yeah, I can tell them, uh, from my role, there's a gap there. From my position, there's a gap there as an Australian Dutch person, I believe. Um, and in that sense, I was very interested in Ricardo also in your, let's say, preliminary conclusions or findings from this very fascinating other modernity that with Santiago Castel Gomez, at least, for example, would would be situated in, 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 in Southern America. Um, yeah, thanks. Not, um, indeed, I think, let's say, this idea of unveiling a subaltern modernity, a Amazonian modernity, is something that actually could have uh, an important consequence on uh, bringing to the fore uh, the histories of peoples that yeah, have been left out from the modernization. And, 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 and it's also because these histories that have been left out, I think, no, they're not part of the archives. Uh, uh, um, because in Venezuela and many other countries, the history of modernization of modernity has been glorified through just exposing certain aspects of the whole story. And a big part of it, maybe that way I go back to what was asked about, yeah, what about modernism, is that I think one of the biggest dangers has been the depoliticization of modernism. No? The disconnection between modernism and modernization is which um, there's, there's a, a very interesting work by a, by a British scholar that did her uh, PhD in Venezuela that talks about this, like by just focusing on the aesthetics of modernism, of modernism as a cultural and uh, you know artistic expression, but cutting it out from the role it had. In modernization from a political point of view it entails a great danger. No? So I think nevertheless it had this alternative history that is very enriching, especially today, that needs to just be revealed. It's, it's, it's still an open question. It's, uh, it's an interesting one too. Would it be fair in the spirit of uh, sequences to give a chance to the audience to raise questions? Oh, I'm not the audience member. We have a few minutes more. Just I'll get the mic. What a pleasure it is to be here today. I just want to thank uh, everyone and the audience. It's amazing to hear you all dialogue. I mean, the spirit of the most human. Um, and we keep hearing about this uh, factor of the local, for instance, and I feel like that is a very undefined concept because we risk perhaps reinserting the spatial constraints of the humanist man uh, to what we mean by local and the fact that we take it as a kind of demarcated common sense notion. So I'm just wondering if there are reflections in the panel about how you define the contours of your site. So what, you know, what is within the realm of the local and how does that not rehearse the spatial constraints of a humanist figure in the in the European uh, so I understand the quick one. Maybe a great question. I would uh, requestion your question by saying where would you look to find the coordinates to that the cartography to begin to answer your question. Um, because, of course, we did not invent delocalization and um, it's circulating as the key word of the new economy. So I, I can tell you where I look, and apart from working in Rotterdam with the new institute and looking at the port of Rotterdam, insofar as we can access information about the port of Rotterdam, which is in the hands of the oil companies, I wanted to remind you, not only the local ones, but the, the global ones, every single fossil fuel industries out there. So where I look is uh, looking uh, carefully at the organs and the official sort of spokespeople of the new economy, Financial Times and Davos, places like that. I would just love to be invited to Davos, but I'm not important enough. 
and listen carefully to what they're telling you. And if Davo is saying that the post-globalization world is decarbonization, delocalization, decolonization, and demographics, you better listen. Because these are people who are not what they're saying. They're hardly our best minds in their think tanks. <laughs> and if they say, this is the new economy, then I go on full alert. And I say, really, decolonization, what could that mean in your hands? <laughs> but it does mean very specific things about how they're designing the new economy. So from there, I'll be looking at ways in which you could map. One of the things, obviously, is that some production is returning, but it's not returning within the nation state. And we're dealing with the regional hubs, which in the case of this city, extend, as I say, from Rotterdam, where you can name it. Now. I think we can go to Poland, um, but probably, depending on how the war plays out, like it would be at the end of that. So mapping this, my question is, how do we actually begin to frame this so that we can even understand the, flow? the philosophy behind it is the losing flows territorialization and deterritorialization, and how we would be able to capture them and map them. And then as we study how the port of Rotterdam has equipped itself for decarbonization, as I said, we better start worrying, because they really mean. Partial question, and I defer. I have a much more simple way of thinking about what counts as the local, and it has to do with loving where you live. Um, and taking care of where you live, and that uh, is not necessarily, it's not about small or big, it's not really about scale, uh, it's about being responsible uh, to where you live, let's call that local for the purposes, and then from there, string figuring and casting out protoplasmic threads, it, uh, the world worldliness of it is really, not for me, not in question. But that loving where, where we live and being accountable to it is, is a fundamental human responsibility. Um, and in that sense, uh, it's my humanism. Um, the last question, last part of the before the break. There's no question. I can <laughs> something completely different. Uh, my research often they ask me about this, like how do you define anarchism? and what are the limits or how, what are the geographical limits of your research and things like this. And actually, what helped me a lot is to understand that is to engage a little bit with messiness. Like there's no this actually territory anarchist territoriality. There is this idea of a country of the state power that goes outside inwards. There's this idea of relational power that goes inside out as much as you can reach the trace you are following. In my research, I decided to do this as long as there are connections, collaborations, uh, physical evidences of of letters and, and, and interactions between certain authors, that's the field or territory that I'm exploring. Once it's somewhere outside of this line, I'm not intending to connect it to, uh, or kind of conceptualize this locality. And actually, it's also something very similar to this. Um, well, I'm not expert, but uh, there is a recent PhD uh, by Kike Espana that actually engages with critical urban theory and Leibniz who in his PhD defined what is situs, not as a point, not in a sense that it, the, everything is a sum of points that have kind of locality for their own kind of co coordinate system, but each point is the sum of all the localities in which you can find the common uh, characteristics. So that's kind of a logic that also I apply in my navigating how to avoid the question of what is anarchism. Can I say one uh, sure. one line, very architectural answer to, to this question of locality? I think for me it was about uh, thinking about the section rather than the plan and like kind of going deep and going up rather than thinking about the expanse. That, that's it. Thank you. On that note, thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, we have to gather energy for the second half. So at this point, we have to break. Uh, let's uh, thank everybody. Let me remind you, uh, we will gather again here in an hour uh, when the coffee and tea will be served in the road number two. Uh, and now we wait for lunch, but we can provide lunch for all of you, unfortunately, only for the guests. Uh, so uh, I invite you to um, 
there's a, there's a restaurant in the building. Uh, in, 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 so, uh, um, thank you very much. But I'm guys.